Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Quantum Dev Room. Um, happy to see that many people found the room. Um, I want to introduce the first speaker of the day, which is Tomasz. Uh, Tomasz holds two master degrees, one in theoretical computer science and one in cybersecurity. And he's one of the co-founders of the Quantum Open Source Foundation and the biotech startup Protein Cure. Um, and he has worked with most of the different quantum hardware architectures and deeply believes in the value of combining quantum computing and open source. So please welcome the speaker with me. All right, guys, can you, can you hear me? OK, it's, uh, it seems like uh, the volume is OK, maybe a little bit too loud. Um, all right. First of all, welcome to the room. We ended up having a little bit um, of an emergency reshuffling. Our original room got flooded, I hear, so that's why we're um, in this bigger space. So this, is, this room is organized by the Quantum Open Source Foundation, and uh, we are happy to be at FOSDEM again. Um, last year was our first year being here, and uh, we really enjoyed it. So we were really happy to be, to be here again, this time in a, in a bigger space. Um, we're going to have 14 speakers today. Um, and we're trying to change the actual kind of theme of the, of the room a little bit this year. Last year, we had a lot of speakers from the quantum computing industry. And we're talking about many different uh, quantum computing libraries. This year, we want to be more dynamic. So we're going to have shorter talks. Um, the length of talks ranges from 35 minutes to 25 minutes. And uh, we'll also be more project focused. So we're going to be speaking more about the projects in the quantum computing space that some you know, academic groups or individuals uh, work on their um, free time on, or as, as part of their job. And last year, we had a little bit of a problem. We had capacity of roughly 90 people, left, I think, in, in the room. And uh, the room got really, really packed. Uh, we, actually, nobody could even like, leave the room and have any hope of getting back uh, throughout the day. This year, it seems like the situation is going to be uh, a little bit, little bit better. Um, but since we, since we moved, and since many people are still probably coming in because they just, just noticed that the room has changed locations, uh, if you see that people are coming in and uh, they're kind of like waiting on the sidelines, and you have seats on, on, on the sides, and there's still space in the, in, in the middle, you know, feel free to kind of compress and, and go into the middle rows such that people have uh, you know, space to sit. OK. And now coming down to actually what I wanted to speak about, uh, which is uh, introduction to quantum software development. So I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about some parallels that we can find in quantum computing space right now um, with the development of machine learning and how the field of machine learning has developed. In the second part, um, I'm going to give you guys a little primer to quantum computing, just a very quick rundown of different architectures and things you need to know about quantum computing to understand um, the rest of the day. And in the last part, OK, uh, in the last part, we're going to speak about a little bit how you guys can help and how you know, software engineers and computer scientists fit into the picture and you know, how you can you know, lead, I guess, hand out your hand and, and offer some help to, the, to these projects. OK. So success of machine learning really falls down not only to machine learning scientists, but also a lot of work that has been done around machine learning to kind of help foster the ease of adoption of, of the tools and uh, developments that are, that are being produced. Uh, one of the big things that helped people develop their own machine learning solutions are machine learning frameworks. Um, and here on this slide, I list a couple of the most popular ones. I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with scikit-learn or TensorFlow, or at least heard about um, these libraries. And Really what these projects do well is that they have really nice, you know, well-documented APIs, tutorials. They have a really good 
basically foundation that they offer to anybody who wants to jump in into the field. So if you want to start machine learning, you don't need to you know, implement your own machine learning algorithms from, from scratch in C++. You can rely on all these libraries and existing frameworks to help you build your models. And that's something that really helps people to jump into the field. Then there's a lot of tooling that has been developed that um, helps people to not only develop their models, for example, in the case of, of Jupyter Notebooks, it's a really great collaboration tool, but also to you know, share their models and deploy them into production. So for example, the Onyx um, framework over here is uh, a tool that helps you, you know, share your model and provide an inference pipeline no matter what kind of framework you use to actually train um, the model itself. So you can see that, once again, the theme repeats. Um, you not only need the underlying algorithms, but you also need to build a lot, lot of tooling to bring um, this technology, machine learning, uh, into the market. And last but not least, a lot of progress in machine learning has been really fueled by just going for bigger and bigger architectures. There's this joke in the community that uh, bigger is, is better and that, that bigger network solves, solves everything. And uh, on this graph on the, on the left, you can, you can see that uh, logarithmic plot. You can see how the different architectures that uh, you know, became really successful, uh, how much training they um, actually need um, per, per day. And you can see that for AlphaGo Zero, reaching like uh, 1,000 petaflops seconds per, per, per day. So once again, basically, this development is largely fueled by engineers working on large-scale systems. On the, on the right, you can see the pictures of the Google TPU, Tensor Processor Processing Unit. Um, which kind of brings in the hardware engineers into the picture. So you can really see that it is an effort of a, of, a, of a whole range of diverse backgrounds that is kind of being combined here to produce the successes that we see today. All right. So now let's kind of, you know, just keep that in, in the back of our uh, minds and let's jump into the uh, part of the quantum computing primer. Um, so I guess you guys are here because you have been hearing a lot about um, quantum computing and uh, yeah, there's like all these very um, hyped up articles. Um, you know, if you, if you scroll through your LinkedIn feeds, um, you're gonna see very various um, sensational things being written about quantum computing. So yeah, the question is how is it gonna actually change our lives? And uh, even more recently, a couple of months ago, quantum has Sorry, Google has announced that they have reached this thing called quantum supremacy. And uh, yeah, what does that even mean uh, for uh, us? Are we gonna throw away our regular computers and everybody's gonna just have a quantum computer now? It's, uh, it's unclear. So the hype uh, is really, really getting uh, higher and higher. This is the article that um, actually announced the quantum um, supremacy and you can see that they used a QPU with 53 qubits that can occupy a state space of two to the 53, because every qubit can um, occupy two basis states. Um, and you can see that if you were to simulate this, uh, this um, problem, it would take you, according to this estimate, 10,000 years on a state-of-the-art supercomputer. So this, this particular transition, having demonstrated that we have solved the problem, which is not necessarily of practical value right now, uh, is what we called, but it's, it's basically solved on a quantum computer, whereas we can't efficiently do it on a, on a classical computer. That's what we call um, quantum supremacy. So it doesn't actually yet mean um, that you know, quantum computer has surpassed classical computers on a practical problem. Um, and that terminology is uh, something that uh, you know, is being fleshed out in the field actually Will Zhang here in the audience has a nice blog post about uh, um, you know, different terms we should use for achieving advantage in, in the quantum computing world with quantum computing uh, architectures. So yeah, right now we are probably, I would say, 
somewhere around the peak. I don't know how many people in the audience who are friendly with the field uh, uh, agree with me. And uh, we're going to see how the hype cycle uh, evolves and what it's going to do um, to the field. But the impact of quantum computing um, really shouldn't be that, you know, we shouldn't be thinking that it's going to come here and it's going to like replace all the methods that, that we already have to solve, solve problems. Um, rather, what we should think about, we should think about quantum computing helping us solve more problems. So uh, what are the things that quantum computers would be, would be good, good at? Well, these are uh, problems like optimization problems. You know, classic example is this traveling salesman uh, problem where you try to find a path through a city um, that is most efficient and visits all the nodes that you specified, for example. Um, you know, encryption and cybersecurity, we can uh, hear a lot about quantum computers being threat to our cybersecurity systems because they're going to break our um, encryption. But we can also use quantum computers to develop better cybersecurity. So um, it's a, it's a two-sided coin. And uh, then there's a big subfield of uh, quantum computing called quantum machine learning, where people are trying to figure out whether quantum computing can help us solve some of the bottlenecks of uh, you know scaling machine learning that uh, we kind of have have today. Um, then on a more I guess near-term side, um, we can use quantum computers to do things that are much closer to what physical systems do. So molecular drug design and uh, kind of the design of, um, of different materials, for example, using organic batteries or, or solar cells, um, are fields where we expect that quantum computing is going to be you know, probably providing some kind of advantage sooner than in some, in some other domains. Now, that was like a very brief introduction. Um, I'm going to jump in this part of the talk a little bit into different paradigms of, of quantum computing and how does the um, kind of field divide a little bit. So there's three major kind of, kind of areas. There's quantum annealing, discrete gate-based quantum computing, and continuous gate-based quantum computing. And I'm going to jump into each of these uh, individually. All right, so in, in quantum annealing, we're trying to find solutions to optimization problems. And basically what we do, we specify some sort of energy landscape. So we define hyperparameters that define the energy landscape. And quantum annealing is a, is a process that in the hardware tries to find the minimum energy state of, of the system. So the system models this landscape that you can see on the left. And the minimum energy state would be the deepest valley of, of this diagram. So um, that corresponds to the conformation of these little proteins that has the lowest energy. Um, and the biggest player in, in the field is the company called um, D-Wave. They're a Canadian company and have been around for a while now, more than a decade, trying to tackle this, uh, this problem. If you look um, at the hardware of, of quantum, uh, quantum annealing, um, you might have seen the picture on the right. That's uh, how the D-Wave machine looks when it's all uh, closed up, but in the middle, um, that's the actual, um, I guess, the chandelier of uh, dilution refrigerators. And uh, you can see how the temperature is dropping all the way to um, the processor uh, on the bottom. So the processor itself runs um, on a temperature that is colder than the temperature in the outer space to minimize all the, all the noise and uh, thermal fluctuations. Here you can see how you know, the scaling of, of, the, of the size of the chips in a quantum annealing kind of evolved. Um, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, I, the company is trying to achieve this, uh, this exponential doubling um, pace that kind of reflects the, the Moore's, Moore's law. Um, and right now, actually, even bigger uh, chip is in uh, development. So the, the highest chip on this graph is 2,000 qubit. Um, and I want you to keep in mind that between the paradigms, the number of qubits or other metrics don't really port. So if I say this has 2,000 qubits, and in some other architecture we have a different number of qubits, that's uh, not directly comparable. Um, here we can see that, uh, basically, this is the architecture of the new generation D-Wave chip. Um, on, on the left, we have this 2,000 Q called the Chimera graph. 
and on the right we have the, this new topology called Pegasus, and the lines here really depict the connections between qubits. So this kind of kind of deter, I guess, yeah, determines which qubits can actually interact in the equation that specifies the energy landscape. So the more connected, the better. But making more connected graphs is um, more difficult in, in, in hardware. Um, so this is how you specify the um, energy landscape. It's a what we call quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem because the uh, variables here are quadratic, uh, sorry, uh, binary, and the terms are at most quadratic. Um, that's all you really need to know. Um, I don't need to like deep dive deep into the details how we specify that, that equation, um, but it's actually not that difficult. It's basically you need to encode the constraints of your problem into some sort of energy penalties that, if um, are violated, they no longer correspond to the lowest energy solution. Of, of that equation. Um, you can see that the things aren't perfect. Here on this, on this graph, you can see that some qubits are missing or some links are, are missing. And there's a bunch of like more lower level problems connected with you know, programming these devices because um, we have to deal with things like finite resolutions. We're going from digital to, to analog. And uh, we might not be able to represent, you know, for example, floating point numbers with the precision we would like um, to have. So there are things that you know, kind of coming to the picture that you might not be used to because you're simply dealing with a technology that is more lower level than, you know, your regular um, classical programming language these days. Um, here is an example of how you, for example, would um, specify a problem. So this encodes the energy landscape of a checkerboard and its uh, lowest energy state is basically a, a state where the neighboring qubits are alternating in value. So they're either 0, 1, 0, 1, or 1, 0, 1, 0. Um, and you do that by imposing a very simple, um, simple matrix of penalties here that is defined there over with the J matrix. And it's really only like a couple of lines of code using the D-Wave uh, standard development libraries. So the workflow in the quantum annealing world is really you define a problem. Uh, you figure out how to you know, encode that problem as this equation. And as I mentioned, you basically do that via imposing different penalties for situations that you don't like. So for example, in the previous case, I would impose a penalty for two qubits being the same value. Once you have the equation, you try to in, what we call embed it on the graph. So you're going to make sure that the qubits that are talking to each other in your equation can talk to each other on, on the hardware. And uh, then you just solve the problem on, on the hardware and you read out your solution. And uh, if you want to guys play a bit, there's D-Wave Leap. Um, it's a platform out of D-Wave that you can have one minute of free QPU time um, to play with um, and some further resources um, for you guys to look at. OK, uh, the universal quantum com computing, um, and I'm going to speed up things a little bit. Um, here we are constructing so-called quantum circuits. So the big players are IBM, Google, Rigetti, and they each are developing their own respective um, uh, libraries that you, know, you can use to specify quantum circuits and uh, run down the, the results. Uh, fundamental building block of quantum computing uh, in this paradigm is uh, qubit, and uh, this is something that you might have seen previously. Um, if not, it's completely fine. Qubit is basically specified by two amplitudes, that's alpha and beta in this uh, equation, and um, those squared specify the probabilities of sampling each of these uh, basis states, uh, either 0 or 1. And uh, basically, in order to program the device, you construct a circuit. So very much similar to you know, classical circuit logic, you specify quantum circuits. Uh, you, you basically have either operations that touch one, two, or, or multiple qubits. And by imposing those operations, you alter the state of the system. You alter what we call the wave function. And at the end of the computation, you just read, read out the, the result. So for example, one of the things that you can do, you can basically introduce entanglement. It's one of the usual building blocks of uh, quantum, quantum algorithms. And you do that using a Hadamard gate. Hadamard gate is nothing else than a certain rotation of, uh, of the qubit 
we can, we can see the result of the rotation um, here for two basis states. Another gate that you can use is a CNOT gate, and if you were to combine the two, you can actually reach um, this uh, combination of states, which kind of imposes that we can only get 0, 0, or 1, 1 out of the system, which we call um, entangled state, or maximal entangled state. Um, so we would do this in a, um, using the Rigetti's library as, as described over here, so you can again see that you know, it's a fairly simple way to specify the circuit. Actually, it generates a circuit in a language called Quill, which is uh, on, on, the, on the right. Um, so it's very much like assembler-like uh, in, in this uh, particular sense. And here, the, mo the, the workflow is, again, very similar. Um, you go from your know, definition problem, then you, you know, figure out the quantum algorithm, you generate a quantum circuit for, for that algorithm, and uh, you compile it to the hardware, so the hardware can only use certain operations. So there's a step called compilation where you make sure that the gates that you're using are actually implemented on the, on the hardware. And then you run your thing on a quantum processor and read out the result. Okay, another paradigm, and the last one that I want to talk about is uh, continuous um, variable quantum computing. And here, instead of having these you know, two basis states, you have a continuum of, of basis states. So instead of qubit, we call the computational building block the q-mode. And uh, for example, one of the applications or one of the kind of building blocks of uh, these systems is um, quantum boson sampling um, that you can use to you know, sample from complex probability distributions. Um, it's well suited for graph models. For example, um, we wrote a, a paper on using Gaussian boson sampling for um, certain molecular docking problems. So that was basically trying to find maximum cliques in certain, certain graphs that we generated. So it's, it's really, you can see that you can have to combine you know, knowledge from quantum computing with knowledge from computer science in order to achieve useful results. And the biggest player um, in, in this field is Xanadu, and actually we have a speaker from Xanadu here today, so he's going to, talk, to tell you more about um, this domain. More resources, if you guys are interested, you can find it in a slide deck. So at the end of the talk, I want to kind of talk about a little bit about how can you become part of this, and uh, you know, what are the, the things that you can actually do to um, you know, help the field out. The nice thing about quantum computing is that um, there's a big push um, in the community for the things to happen in, in the open source way. Not only the research itself, but also like all the underlying building blocks. Um, the libraries are available open source, and uh, you know it really helps reproducibility, but also it helps more people um, join the field. Um, so like all of these, not all of these, but many of these uh, quantum hardware providers are also providing uh, open source libraries to program their devices or play with their quantum virtual machines, quantum simulators. Um, and that is, uh, that is really nice for us to be able to um, you know, spread the knowledge. The kind of implicit thing about the field is that it, it comes from you know, academia to, to a degree, and many people working on these open source projects are scientists, um, and they're doing a great job, but uh, many of them are not uh, software engineers by training, and there's a huge potential in, um, you know, more of software engineers being uh, in, involved and helping, you know, scale and design APIs and, and just build the system in, in a way that follow the best practices of uh, software engineering. Um, so there's like a huge uh, list of projects uh, on our website. Uh, the links are on the right that you can use to see a um, you know quite exhausting list of different projects in different different areas. And I want to mention some of those here. So these are things like quantum comp compilers or quantum circuit optimization, where you try to make sure that you modify the circuit in such a way that you let's say optimize the number of gates. And at the same time, you produce the same kind of a result um, at the end. Um, there are things like development of control systems. So we're actually going to have a speaker today speaking, speaking about um, an open source project for control systems in, in the quantum computing. Um, we have things like quantum games or 
uh, IDE tools, visualization tools. So there are a lot of these things that need to be developed. Now we can draw the parallels that uh, I was speaking about in the case of machine learning. Um, a lot of work needs to be done um, for us to be able to like, do research and really develop this field further. And a lot of that work is um, you know, fundamental software engineering uh, basically waiting to be fulfilled. So feel free to jump into any of those things. Um, community is very, very open. And uh, I'm certain that they would love um, you know, a helping hand from people that can uh, you know, tell them how to structure or package their Python library better and put, them, put it on PyPy because maybe right now it's on GitHub and it's not even installable for PyPy. So there are a lot of opportunities like that if you guys want to jump into the space and, and learn more, more about the, the area. And if you guys feel even more adventurous, um, there's an a incubator that is dedicated to quantum computing slash quantum machine learning. Actually, Sean is in the room. Sean is one of the people organizing it. Sean, if you could wave your hand so that people know they could talk to you in, in, in a break if they're, if they're interested. And uh, that's actually where my company started. So uh, shout out to these guys. And uh, if you want to help with... Uh, you know, education and outreach. You can speak to me and Mark. Uh, we are running the Quantum Open Source Foundation. Um, you can join our Slack channel um, if you want to become part of the community and know more about um, the events and things that we're organizing. And uh, yeah, for that purpose, you can also follow us on Twitter or other social media accounts, or just GitHub or GitLab if you guys fancy that. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, also. Um, Oh, yeah. Um, and there's also a micro, micro grant program from, uh, from Will called Unitary Fund. So that's unitary.fund. Uh, you can check out if you are interested in doing a project, but you're not sure if you could you know, support it yourself. Uh, there's a way to get funding for that as well. Um, all right. So that, thanks you, thank you for the attention. And uh, let's uh, wait for the next talk.